Right, so moving then to the next items on the agenda. Um, item five, deputations by appointment, there are none. Presentation of petitions, item six, there are none. So that now sees us move to item seven, the Christchurch Wastewater Treatment Plant Recovery Update Presentation. Um, so this will take the form of a slide presentation by our own staff. Um, I'd then also like to welcome Dr. Cheryl Brunton, the um, Medical Officer of Health, to join us. Um, so if we take the presentation, if we then take the um, uh, comments from Cheryl Brunton, the update from Cheryl Brunton, and then we'll move into questions after that. Thank you. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, so what we've got up on the slide is the order of the presentation this morning. So we're going to very quickly go through an update of what's happened in the last couple of weeks since we um, briefed elected members. Um, and we really want the focus of today's briefing to be on the, um, the medical um, well-being and the, um, the mental well-being of the communities that are being affected by the odour. Um, and as Andrew, you've acknowledged, we've got um, representatives of the um, DHB here today to talk directly to that. Um, so like usual, I've got um, most of the team here. I've got quite a few of the team away um, unwell. Um, so um, apologies if, if you do have questions for us that we can't answer. We'll do our best. So um, we will start off with uh, Gary. Um, good morning, everybody. Oh, I'm going to be really fast as I go through this. Uh, so... Um, I guess the gist of the first slide really is that payments have slowed down considerably over the last two weeks. Um, we are currently um, investigating, having a look uh, to bring back an options report for you to the 28th of July. When it comes back on the 28th of July, it will have been peer reviewed by the partner groups you can see up there, it would have been peer reviewed by the community liaison group as well. So when we're back on the 28th of July, um, hopefully um, that will be uh, an options report that has been um, across a broad spectrum of people. Um, just move to the next one quickly. Uh, this is just to show the map of the out of zones. Um, obviously the in zone is greyed out there. Uh, the dots around the outside, the greens are um, applications we've accepted. The reds are applications that we've declined. Um, we're currently running at about 53, 54% of uh, um, out of zone applicants have been accepted. Um, I'm holding fast to the um, health, um, uh, health wind and everything else. However, when we come back on the 28th, I've been made aware of uh, some monitoring reports that are changing. Um, history and climate will definitely change in the next few months. So um, the zone, uh, one of the options may look quite different to what's up there now. Uh, the schools, uh, I guess just to say, um, I think I'm about 99% through, I can't say 99, the mass doesn't work. Let's say 90% uh, through all of the invoices and they are through for processing of payments. Um, uh, really that's all that's on that page, really. Uh, yeah, it was pretty quick, but I realise there's more important people than me today. Okay, so Bruce will now just give you a bit of an update of what we've been doing with um, business support. So um, as you know, last time we talked a little bit about some of the businesses um, putting their hands up and asking for a bit of assistance. So we've had Bruce working on that. Yep, so this is an emerging piece of work over the last couple of weeks um, since it's been raised. Um, We've started through working with some of the major agencies, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and Christchurch NZ to, uh, to see what they had heard, what um, themes were coming through. Uh, they have then directed us to some initial uh, affected businesses and we're starting to uh, have meetings with those. Um, so far what I'm hearing is that uh, the impact on workers is the key issue that they're facing. Um, and that we need to make sure we're getting that feedback and communication through to, to those businesses uh, and using them as a channel. And we're starting to have those discussions with our, uh, our comms team around working with businesses to provide uh, communication as well. Um, 
it's been a bit of a snowball as businesses have um, identified other businesses. We're starting to make those contacts and then go and have those further discussions. Um, in terms of ideas for help, I know that that you know is often the focus that you, you were wanting to take. Um, it's really communication at this stage, um, but we will, as we gather further information from affected businesses, we'll um, take those ideas on board that they raise as well. Yeah. Hi, Nigel Grant from Environmental Health. Uh, just the, the first two points, we can take that, is um, we've, we've completed the grab sampling, we've presented that previously, and also that it'll be discussed further as well. Uh, Cheryl will also talk about the fact hydrogen sulphide is one of the primary gases that we identified as, as causing uh, issues for people, and it, it's one, fortunately, that can be uh, easily detected with our monitors. So. Um, yeah, so we, we've currently started with one, then two more monitors that are in place now that are doing continuous monitoring. We have uh, further six monitors, which will be 4G, so they, they won't have to be visited into the, in the field, uh, and they're, they're on their way to us at the moment. Um, just, yeah, so we would like to think that in another week or two we'll have those up and active as well. So, um, just quickly, that, that shows you the extent of the um, where the grab samples were taken from. They're the, they're the maps, and uh, we started off just around the pond, and then uh, our, our consultant who was doing the work uh, became, obviously became quite interested in following the wind and where the smell was, and so has, has just broadened out. And on the day follow, on the days that the sampling were due, um, yeah, just just followed the wind and, and where the odours was, and so we ended up with quite a diverse. Um, collection of sample sites o over time. So um, the next, this, this slide here is, is uh, showing where, the, um, where we're proposing to put the, put the monitors. So you can see there the ones, the, the red ones will be the long-term monitoring that we'll have in place the whole time. And we'll hold, hold back a couple of uh, metres that uh, guys can place from week to week in different locations as well to start building up uh, more information, and you see down there in the right-hand corner is a um, call a wind rose, which which shows that that the wind conditions of June to September, based on previous years, shows shows the wind direction. So that's obviously where our sampling sites ref reflect that. Uh, that's pretty much it. So there's been there's been discussion about um, the, the you know what's what's an accept what's a safe or acceptable level for um, hydrogen sulphide in particular, and it, and it is, is, is difficult. No New Zealand agency seems to have a, a definite um, definite levels, but we've, we've just put some ones up there for you. So it's, um, yeah, we've discussed it's, it's definitely strong and offensive even at very low concentrations. And one of, I've spoken before, also there's a meth, methyl mercaptan, which is um, also very odorous, uh, and, and can be detected at extremely low levels, way below any level which will call, actually cause physical harm. So that that's there as well. But focusing on hydrogen sulphide uh, has a has a wide range of um, de detection level, and it uh, apparently decreases with age as well. So people have different different reaction to to its you know whether they can smell it or not. I'm probably a good example of that. I when I, the smell that I smell is usually the methyl mercaptan rather than hydrogen sulphide. Um, yeah, so the, the concentrations are, um, at the, yeah, are above the odour threshold. Yeah, the, the concentrations can be substantially above the odour threshold and that, that can lead to annoying and discomforting symptoms such as your headaches and nausea. There's a work safe level up there as well. That's obviously quite a bit higher, but that, that reflects on the fact that People that are exposed to that level are for eight hours, and then they they spend the balance of their time in fresh air. But it is relevant. Um, we we have staff there at the plant, and also there's quite a um, a swathe of industrial um, area as well, where where people have staff, and I've certainly spoken to businesses about how they can what they can do for their staff in those areas. So they are affected by the, the wind drifts down that road. Um, so the principal one we're using is, the, is that Californian Office of Environmental Health Assessment, um, and it, it is 0.03 parts per million. 
and it you can see there that it's um, it's detected at yeah 83 percent of people um, will smell it at that level and 40 percent will find it discomforting so that just going back to the one above it's a um, it has quite a wide quite a wide range of how it affects people so that's cool the um, yeah so there's there's just a shot of um, now that we're starting to get some information from the monitors uh, there's we'll um, we'll look at um, how we can best start to uh, report that back onto our website in a in a in a, f a readable friendly manner to show to show what we're recording that one there is the wind directions on top and the levels detected underneath and you can see it obviously corresponds um, pretty closely that that site is um, Bromley school out and it's driven by the uh, northeast wind so you can see the responses there that's that's just a um, a shot the meter's not there normally that was just a shot taken by um, yeah, t taken by our consultant who's um, yeah they're now going to uh, have got a bit of a future in producing a coffee table book of oxidation ponds around the country with the photography but so that, that's where it sits that, that's what it looks like and we're just putting those in um, a variety of locations as I showed you around there before so bird life at the ponds I spoke to um, you know I understand there's been some interest in that um, I'm environmental health I'm not ecology but I've, I caught up with Andrew Crossland yesterday and um, yeah, so the points from him are that you can see there that there's only Canada geese remaining at the ponds and some shag species roost in nearby trees. Um, all other bird life that relied on the midges or their larvae as a food source have left the ponds. They've gone away, there's, there's not the food source there for them anymore. Um, and obviously that, um, that's, that's a reaction to the reduced water quality. Um, there was an earlier avian botulism outbreak at the ponds, but that's not the reason for all of the birds disappearing, obviously. And equally, Andrew's very clear that the chemicals used in the firefighting are not considered to be the reason why we've seen a, you know, almost a complete absence. He sent me a photo, I, I haven't put it up, sorry, but you know, he sent me a photo of the ponds that are just covered in birds, and, and we, whereas you see that picture there before, they've, they've, um, they've gone, so, yeah. So collaborative meeting with medical officer of health, I've said before we're having those on a very regular basis. I just, I'll just i use this heading also just to note, um, Yani has asked about whether we've had contact with NIWA. We have had contact with NIWA. NIWA have, um, their position is people ringing in, talking to them, is that they're, they're directed to um, regional council. NIWA say the air quality is not, is not, not what they do for uh, a regulatory type type issue, so they're not the same. They're not the same as MFE, for instance. They're they're essentially another consultant group. However, they it was really good. I I got to speak to one of their um, air quality scientists up in Auckland. She's very much involved in um, particulate measuring particular particular matter wood wood burners. That's what they're working on at the moment. However, however, she was very interested for me to give her an overview of what we're doing. She equally knows knows of the. We have three staff um, with three scientists that are supporting us through Ministry of Health, our own consultant, and ECAN. She knows all those people. She says they're really, you know, says we're in we're, we're in very strong hands with them, and that's that's really what Niwa and they are very interested to keep in contact with us as well. So next time they're passing through Christchurch, I'll arrange a meeting with our scientists with with their one. Um, so paint. Paint staining. I've talked about that um, previously. The mold, mold types have been found um, to be typical for an out, outdoor environment, and the, 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 so the discoloration we're seeing is not attributed to um, any any mold, unusual mold species. However, this uh, just at the end of this week, tomorrow, we have our consultant uh, going out and testing a number of houses, um, looking at other reasons for that staining, and we'll be able to report back on that. I would hope um, within two weeks, and just. Just to uh, finally just talk about noise, I've previously said we've, um, we're looking at the noise. The, the, it's gone okay with the first, um, the first filter. The second filter, the way it's worked out is that the chipper is end up going to be screened more from Shorten Street as well. So we're predicting that that's, that's not going to cause a lot of distraction for uh, the residents. So that's pretty much me. <coughs> Uh, Adam Tews, Manager of Operations, just giving an update on the interim operations. Um, P 
pictures you see up there is the completed bypass um, pipe for to get past the trickling filters. So that's fully completed and we're just in the stages of commissioning and testing that pipeline now this week. Um, we did set up the temporary pumps there that we've seen to try and get a kickstart on growing the biomass needed for the activated sludge plant. That has now been switched off so that we can enable the final installation of the 16 permanent pumps that are going in now because they physically sit in the way of that. The 16 permanent pumps are installed and being commissioned next week as well. Uh, so the pumps obviously have to be connected via pipework and the last stage of that pipework now is also going in and that will also be completed next week. So in summary, the new temporary activated sludge plant, which will replace the function of the trickling filters, should be completed by next week. It will take two to three weeks for the biomass to grow. Um, to, for that process to be fully operational. Unfortunately, trying to kickstart that biological process in the depths of winter is, is not ideal. Normally, you try and start this process in the summer where it's nice and warm conditions for the bugs to grow, um, hence why we're predicting up to three weeks for that to become fully operational. Uh, good morning, Helen Beaumont, uh, look after three waters. So as Adam has pointed out, we're sort of 95, maybe 98% of the way there with the interim operations and getting the equipment in place. Unfortunately, until 100% is in place and we're putting the wastewater through that process, we continue to overload our oxidation ponds. So they are still performing poorly given those high loads and the very cool temperatures we're having through the winter. Uh, we are doing some parallel works to assist those ponds, so we're still dosing uh, hydrogen peroxide, which degrades into oxygen and water, at the outlet of the, um, of the plant and into those oxidation ponds to increase the oxygen levels. We've also got mechanical aerators both in the pond and being sourced from around the country, and we do have one supplier who has offered to trial uh, a different type of aerator, and we're looking into that. We are also considering some chemical dosing of the ponds to interfere with the production of hydrogen sulphide. So that, that work's going on in the background. In terms of the timelines for pond recovery, uh, until that biomass is established in the activated sludge basins, uh, we won't see fresh water going into those ponds. So we won't see much better quality wastewater. And so we need to wait that three weeks for the biomass to establish, and then it'll take another at least three weeks and maybe a little longer for the water to flush through those six ponds. So we've got six ponds. They're quite, um, they're quite big ponds, uh, and it takes a month or so for the water to pass all the way through. Uh, now, the result of all of that is that our wastewater discharge through the offshore outfall continues to exceed the standard values in our resource consent, and so we continue to notify Environment Canterbury and the Medical Officer of Health of those faecal coliform and enterococci values as we're required. Uh, and in response, we've doubled our beach sampling. So we sample at three places along the beach to check that it's not affecting the coastal water quality. Uh, and we're pleased to report that those high bacterial loads going out three kilometres offshore are not affecting the results at the beach. So the, the results at the beach are within standard values. Uh, and we're also doing some shellfish sampling because the, um, the beach sampling is a grab sampling, but the shellfish sample the water for us all the time. So we're doing some shellfish sampling to, um, to check on those. And we haven't got all the results back yet. Um, the preliminary results are looking good, but um, we're waiting for all of, the, all of the various determinants for that. In terms of um, interim operations, one of, the, um, one of the things we've talked about before is that the... The plant as it was, um, was a very robust and resilient operation and we had a lot of redundancy. So if something broke down, we could simply divert this, the, um, the wastewater, shut down a small part of the plant, do the maintenance work and then bring it back online. During the interim operation of the plant, we don't have that resilience and redundancy and robustness of process. So we are doing some work. Um, the, first of all, the interim operation has been designed and installed to last for up to five years. So we haven't just done it for 12 months or 24 months in terms of best case scenario for the replacement plant. We have put it in place for up to five years to ensure that we have good operational capability through that time. 
We've also reviewed what we need to hold on site in terms of critical spears. In the past, we held critical spears, but just what we needed, given the redundancy in the plant. Now we don't have that redundancy. We've increased the list and scope of those critical spears, and we're obtaining those so that they're on the shelf at the plant and we don't run into supply difficulties. Uh, and you, you, we're all aware of what the supply chains are like at the moment. Uh, the other thing we've done is review all of our maintenance schedules. So um, the maintenance on the plant has increased uh, to make sure that we don't get uh, any breakdowns or we really minimise the number of breakdowns we uh, experience on the plant. Uh, and in the background behind that, we're also very closely monitoring the wastewater through the treatment process. So we've set up a little mini lab that the treatment plant operators can use rather than relying on our, our large lab. We're still doing the, the main sampling through the large lab, but they can do some quick physical and chemical and biological tests themselves on a daily or even hourly basis if they're worried about something and get an instant feedback and, um, and change the operation of the plant straight away. Uh, and we've co-located uh, our capital works team for works on the plant site with our operations team to make sure that um, anything happening on the site doesn't interfere unnecessarily with the, the good operation of the plant. So um, we do have, of course, good discussions between our capital works teams that are based in Civic and our operations teams out at the plant. But given how busy the site is at the moment, we decided that co-locating those teams to improve that further uh, was a good idea. And then I'll whip back up to the top. Um, we are, of course, the options assessment for replacement is underway and for the replacement treatment process. And we expect to get a report to you in November or December, so towards the end of this year. Thanks, Helen. I'll keep this quick in the uh, interest of time. Um, so firstly, good morning, everyone. Um, the first of the structures, um, if not by now, certainly by close of play tomorrow, will be completely emptied of filter media. Uh, that's six weeks ahead of the scheduled um, date. Um, we are on schedule for um, uh, starting removal of media from the second structure, which will commence next week. Um, so at this stage, um, we are comfortable that we will be um, on track to remove media before the 7th of September. Um, you can see on the right hand side of the slide up there, there's an infographic. That infographic goes up on Council's public uh, facing website uh, end of each week. And that just gives a quick tally uh, for people to look at to see how many truck loads, uh, truck and trailer loads have, have left the site. Um, how much uh, media in terms of tonnage has been removed in total plus for the week. Uh, gives a little information on wind direction. There's some information up there too on the um, public support, uh, community support package. And um, I guess the key one is in the top right hand corner. Uh, it shows the two trickling filters and the amount of media that has been um, removed from both. Um, as seeing is believing, there's a picture that was taken, uh, I think it was Wednesday, Tuesday this week, um, that shows uh, the first structure. Um, all that's left within it is some of the uh, dribs and drabs at the bottom um, and the central uh, tower that um, supported the uh, rotating um, trickler arms. Um, so that will be um, effectively cleaned out uh, by the end of this week and next week as already stated they'll be commencing removal of the media on the second structure. Okay. Kia ora koutou, Simon Maka. I am the Senior Communications Advisor. Uh, so just giving you a quick update on communications over the past couple of weeks. We're still continuing to roll out um, Newsline blog items every two or three, two or three times a day. Um, that can be anything from you know, just a simple wind forecast for the coming day, um, progress on site with photos, um, how the community support package is going, or any testing that gets published, we can cross-promote it straight from the blog to the website. And the website itself, we're also updating two to three times a week. Uh, we'll continue to respond to questions and updates uh, about the community support and the on-site works as people send them through via social media or just general media queries. Uh, we put a video up last week or the week before now uh, just to show you know, how we've uh, modified the plant um, and, and the different measures we've had to put in place since the November fire. We're also working on another video now to show how the two processes are different. So one, how the wastewater treatment plant worked before the fire 
and then another one about how it works after the fire and the different modifications have made along the way to um, make sure that that treatment process continues. Uh, still continuing to put out weekly e-newsletter. Um, that is also done in a hard copy version that's uh, made available at our uh, community providers and is also made into an A2 poster that is put on the uh, information plinths um, at the community providers as well. Um, and we've also put out some flyers via the community advisory group um, to promote the public meetings that we've had, the two we had this week, and, and also working on a different flyer for the South Shore, South New Brighton, um, just because we might be able to um, put some information around the webinar that we've got planned as well. Um, just It is a smaller space at the South Shore, South New Brighton Community Centre, and ju we just want to make sure that everyone's got access to the information. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so what's coming up? Um, our fourth public meeting is uh, on the evening of 7th July um, at uh, South New Brighton Community Centre. Um, we have a webinar planned for the 13th of July. Um, Adam has already touched on the uh, pumps, the 16 pumps that are being installed. Uh, Nigel's talked to you already about the 4G monitoring devices that are being rolled out over the next couple of weeks. Um, I've touched on the ramp for Filter 2 is on schedule. It'll be completed by the end of this week with removal of media commencing beginning of next week. Um, we're continuing investigations to determine what the discolouring on uh, paint is and our social recovery response plan is uh, progressing well. Um, right, just as a segue to um, having Cheryl and Lucy here, um, as um, Alexandra said, we had two public meetings on Tuesday um, at the Bromley Community Centre. Um, by far the, the key issues that came through the questions and the comments from the community mem members who attended was around health impacts. So how people were feeling um, both in terms of their mental wellbeing but also their physical wellbeing. So there were a lot of questions around health and it's such a really perfect timing um, that Cheryl and Lucy is now, now going to sort of present to you um, their views on, on what's been happening and um, their role. Um, so can I just invite um, Cheryl, um, Medical Officer of Health, and um, Dr Lucy Dave, um, who, and we've been working with um, both these very talented women um, to line up both our response and the response of the um, health professionals. So Cheryl and Lucy, thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning. We appreciate you, you being here and the time that you're taking to, to do so. Um, and obviously look forward to um, hearing what you've got to tell us. Thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou and thank you for this opportunity. Just uh, one of the things that might be important to point out, Lucy and I both work for Community and Public Health, which is the Canterbury District Health Board's um, service for, which provides regional public health services to Canterbury, South Canterbury and West Coast, as it happens. Other parts of the DHB, such as planning and funding, commission and fund services, and of course you will be familiar, I'm sure, with the fact that the DHB itself runs services, Primary care is funded by, but not directly provided by the, the DHP. So just kind of putting us in context, because some of the questions we've been asked actually relate to other parts of the DHP other than ourselves. Essentially, we're providing a support role and have done for council's response. And we're involved, as has already been alluded to, in two of those council-led work streams, the, particularly the environmental monitoring stream and social response. It's been my role as one of the medical officers of health to be part of that environmental monitoring. And Lucy has been part of the social response group along with the other agencies that you're aware of. In terms of how we're managing that internally within community and public health, we're aiming to coordinate our input across both of those groups so that essentially uh, Lucy and I are the touch points for those particular groups and we're working to provide a coordinated response from our end. So essentially, just a quick what we've done so far, one of the first things that we did was to engage an independent air quality consultant to provide peer review of our advice on exposure and risk assessment. Um, we've done so through the services that the Ministry of Health is able to provide to us, and that's been, as, I, as others have alluded to, invaluable, um, to have a, a, a number of very qualified minds working together around this. We've also provided through that monitoring group advice around exposure assessment, so I've been actively involved in the decisions around the locations of monitoring. 
Um, and also we have sought advice from other public health units throughout New Zealand where they've had experience of dealing with populations affected by exposure to foul odours. And there are, there are some of those, but unfortunately that hasn't been hugely fruitful in terms of advising us of anything that we perhaps didn't already know. We have also sought information from local general practices and Pegasus Health, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, and also from Healthline and the National Poison Centre in terms of being able to uh, identify health effects. We have considered Council's request to set up a health register, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that shortly. The other thing that we have done is to link um, City Council into the CDHB's planning and funding division regarding the possibility of funding general practice visits for affected people. The, we've approached seven practices in the east of the city. We cast the net quite widely through to at least three kilometres radius of the oxidation ponds. And most of those local general practices, with the exception of one, had reported no increase in consultations in relation to the health effects of the odour. But there's an important qualifier to that in that what we were told by the practices is that whilst people are not specifically making appointments to saying I'm being affected by the odour and I want to talk to the doctor, most of them, the reporting that they were able to provide us around the symptoms people were experiencing was from people who were attending the practice but for other reasons. As interestingly, also from some of their own staff who live within the areas that where people are exposed. Now, the common, most commonly reported symptoms at the practices were nausea, headaches, eye and throat irritation, skin irritation, worsening asthma, and sleep disturbance. And all of those are very consistent with exposure, particularly to hydrogen sulfide, at the kinds of concentrations that are being measured in the council's monitoring. The other important thing, which I know that you are all very well aware of, is that there has been an effect on people's mental well-being, and that has been predominantly negative. And so patients presenting to these particular primary care practices have been reporting considerable distress, frustration, and a sense of powerlessness. Now, some of those practices are already providing support for the mental health and well-being for their patients affected by the odour using the health improvement practitioners and health coaches at those practices. We did, we made some requests with Pegasus um, help uh, to look at data from Healthline. Now, I've put this up here to show you, but it's, it's not hugely helpful. One of the things that we were, because it conflates all of the symptoms together, so this is reports of any of those symptoms, but what I just would direct your attention to on the left of the graph is that there is a clear rise in reported symptoms within the period of sort of April through May for the Christchurch area as a whole. However, um, a lot of, there has also been a concomitant rise, as I'm sure you are aware, in influenza and other illnesses which are likely to be a contributor to that. The data specifically from the Bromley area, as you can see, goes up and down. This includes data from on the left hand side of that graph um, from last from late on last year. With the eye of faith you might say that there has been some increase, but again the numbers on the um, horizontal or the vertical axis as you can see are a lot smaller. But that is consistent with the kinds of reports from the wider community in terms of when these particular effects started to become a problem. The data from the Poison Centre wasn't hugely helpful. They had only had six calls in total with regard to the wastewater treatment plant. Three of those were at the time of the fire and one of those was from someone in Wellington. Um, the, other, the other two... Uh, more recent reports. One was about human health effects and it was about someone who was experiencing worsening asthma and they were advised to see their general practitioner. The other was actually in concern about the health of pets. Um, one of the things that it's just important to understand before I go on to talk specifically about the health <coughs> register question is that although it might seem intuitively simple to be able to get health information down to an individual level through from general practices is that the coding of when you visit your GP, how your encounter is coded, doesn't necessarily give any insight into the reasons for your presentation. It's simply about the symptoms or the disease that you've been identified with. So one of the things we did ask Pegasus, for example, is would it be possible even to look at whether or not 
asthma rates were higher this time than, you know, than last year. Problem with that is, aside from the difficulty of accessing the data, is that we've had an unusual two years up until now when um, viruses have been largely prevented from entering New Zealand, not just COVID. And so we've had unusually low levels of respiratory illness in the last two years, so they're not really a very good comparator for what's happening this year. So if you like, there is a kind of a perfect storm for many people this year. We have both COVID, we have, COVID, we have influenza, we have other respiratory viruses, and for the people experiencing the issues with odour, we've got that too. So, and there's quite a lot of crossover with regard to those symptoms. Now, we received on behalf of the DHB a request from Council on the 9th of June to consider a establishing a health register. In uh, considering that request, we did a number of things. We reviewed the literature about registers, particularly in relation to environmental exposures. Most of that literature refers to events such as flooding or things along those lines, which you would kind of intuitively think of as an environmental uh, disaster situation. We also sought uh, through the Ministry advice for an environmental health um, expert who has been involved in a number of situations in New Zealand, particularly dealing with contaminated sites, including Paritutu, which some of you may recognise as the site of the former Ivor Watkins Dow factory. But again, that's not so directly applicable because what was, what was being dealt with there was exposures that had happened quite some time in the past to both residents and to workers. We did attempt to identify whether there were any other similar registers anywhere else in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and the answer is that there aren't. Um, we also considered the legal requirements around the collection of and use of health information because any register that's established needs to do that um, and is subject to the Health Information Privacy Code. And it's important to recognise there that the collection of health information and the use of health information is subject to that particular legal framework. And one of the core principles around that is that um, information, if information is collected, it must be for a specific purpose. So one of the things that we inferred from Council's request was that because it wasn't specific about what the purpose of the register was, is that there might be a range of reasons why a register could be established. For example, a register could be established to attempt to um, estimate the population who are affected by a particular problem. It could be created to ensure that people had access to care who were affected. Or it could be for, if you like, just broadly monitoring and surveillance purposes. However, one of the things that we were very conscious of because of both the publicity and things like the um, Facebook page to a crisis is that people who are suffering from effects of the odour are actually very keen and anxious that that be acknowledged. A register is not the only way that that can be done. Similarly, a register is actually rather a, a difficult and clumsy way of ensuring that people have access to care, which is also one of the issues. There are a number of reasons, and these are only some, why a health register therefore might not be a suitable mechanism to systematically monitor the health impacts of an exposure like the stench from the uh, damaged wastewater treatment plant in ponds. The true denominator of people who are exposed is unknown. And uh, Council will be aware from the data from the smelted app that I know you have seen before is that people are reporting um, experiencing the odour from all over Christchurch, although the predominance of reports are in the east. But actually, we don't necessarily know um, how many people might be exposed. It's similarly also true that the numerator for anything where we're trying to look at rates would be difficult to measure. And for example, if um, registering on the registry involved a visit to a general practitioner, then it's very likely that health impacts would be underreported from them there. So the combination of those two things is also relevant in terms of many of these situations where we're dealing with an environmental exposure, one of the things you're trying to do is to find out whether people have been affected or not. And I think actually we already know. <laughs> and we know that people are um, are affected by this. I think the other thing that's important is that any health effects need to be interpreted in the context of baseline health status. And we know, for example, that the eastern side of the city is more socioeconomically deprived. We know it has a diverse population. And we also know that 
just at baseline, there is an issue with access to primary care. So a whole number of things which uh, make that particular population much more vulnerable. I think the other considerations, but they're kind of secondary, but they are real, is that it's actually far from simple to set up and maintain a health register. If you're talking about looking at long-term health effects, you could be talking about something that you have to set up which would be in place for decades. And that is in itself problematic um, in the current environment. I think the most important thing, however, as I've said before, is that a health register doesn't actually directly address people's health needs. It's a tool, but it's not the only way that that could be done. So kind of in summary, in terms of our assessment of the health effects of the odour arising from the wastewater treatment plant in ponds is that actually there is enough evidence from a number of sources, including the community itself, that people exposed to these odours are experiencing both physical and mental health effects. And that the effects are exactly and very, very consistent with what might be expected given the monitored, measured concentrations of hydrogen sulphide at the sites that have been monitored so far. And these health effects would be expected to resolve when the production of the odour is reduced back to the pre-fire levels as a result of the measures that you've already heard about being taken by the various arms of council. I think there is one qualifi qualifier to that which it's important to emphasise is that people can become sensitised. And I don't mean allergic in this sense, it's not the same thing as an allergy, but sensitised to the effects of odour such that they may both they may experience some of these health effects at very low concentrations in future. And we don't know for certain whether or not that is happening here, but it's likely that it will be for at least some people. And I'm also very cognizant of the effect the fact that some of the people being affected currently by the odour from the wastewater treatment plant are also people who've been affected by the odours from the composting plant. So a certain amount of sensitization would be expected in that population. So for those people, it may well be that although the health effects improve, they don't completely resolve because of that potential sensitization. Speaking particularly for hydrogen sulfide, which is the contaminant of interest here, it's unlikely that at the concentrations measured so far, that the health effects that people are experiencing are likely to persist long term, however, or that there would be different or other long-term health effects from exposure. The evidence we have around the long-term effects of hydrogen sulfide exposure largely comes from people who have, been exper have experienced very high exposures, but have survived, so they're not death, um, but have then continued to have other problems. Hydrogen sulfide is primarily, um, because it's a gas, the primary route of exposure for people is inhalation from in there so that that's that's kind of and again you say you breathe in and you also breathe out and hydrogen sulfide does not accumulate in the body so it's when it's present those health effects are experienced but when it's gone they're not at the levels that we are talking about here as opposed to the kind of levels that might exist and might be a problem um, as Helen has mentioned for workers particularly workers working in confined spaces with the gas, where because the gas is heavier than the air, the concentrations can rise quite rapidly. And that can lead, unfortunately, to lethal outcomes. This is not what we are talking about in terms of um, wider community exposure. That's it. So, All right, um, thank you. So does that bring us to the end of the presentation um, from everybody? Yes. Yep, great. So now let's move to questions. Um, and it would be good um, as you ask questions if you know whether you're directing them to, to our staff or to the um, medical officer of health um, um, or you, you know if we, if we can work that out as, yeah, as we go. Yeah, I just wonder whether it would be useful um, while um, Lucy, um, uh, while, there's the, while the woman's sitting here that we have the health questions first. Why don't we do that? And That's a good idea. Thank you. Up and change. Yep. All right. So um, questions for the, um, Dr. Cheryl Brunton and the medical team first. Um, Yanni. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It's really good to hear, you know, the, the, the work that you have been doing over assessing what's going on. I, I guess the kind of general concern that I have, and I, I'd be interested to see if there was a way forward, is, you know, if you take 
WorkSafe, for example, they put requirements on companies to have health monitors for people that are exposed to possible hazardous um, substances, as I understand it. They recommend 30 years for non-asbestos-related substances. Given, just at a high level, uh, I mean, I, I hear your concern around the health register, but I think people in, this, in these communities are increasingly concerned that there is a prevalence of um, health impacts because of the nature of some of the industries and because of um, what they're experiencing. Is there any other mechanism that you've considered, you know, working with the university or working with other government agencies that could be put in place to try and get a sense of what's happening at a community population level in these areas? Recognising that, of course, um, the wastewater treatment plant fire is a relatively new thing that's happened, but there's also been things like, um, you know, there's been a whole range of issues with dust, with um, quarrying is obviously one not in this area, but in other parts of the city. Um, we've had organics plant and we've had um, concrete, I think concrete um, crushing or, or, or um, that sort of industry. So. You know, is there anything that we can do to reassure the community that we can look at the population level impacts that these industries um, and types of environmental impacts are having on their health so that, you know, they can have confidence that things can be recorded and recognised going forward? Good question. Thank you. Uh, I think I will take your last point first, but also quali um, qualify that my answer is specific to the current issue with around the odour, but that in terms of recorded and acknowledged, I think one of the most important things that people can do is to see their general practitioner and to have the information about their current condition and its relationship to the odour recorded. Um, people's health records do follow them around the place, and certainly that provides us with probably one of the best sources of data. In terms of the... Um, the kind of the, the wider environment. One of the issues that we have always when looking at the population level is disentangling multiple factors in terms of the causation of any health effects they're experienced. However, what I perhaps would like to reassure you is that in terms of um, the new health service, which we'll be part of from tomorrow, is that one of the key uh, and core principles around delivery of health services is making sure that a health needs assessment is done at a population level. So, for example, the wider DHB is probably already very well aware of a number of the key factors that are having an impact on the health of people out east, but also in other parts of Christchurch and in the wider region of Canterbury. The degree to which one can fine-tune that and attribute that to any particular exposure is a huge problem, and also one that, in terms of the broader practice of environmental health, which is, is my field, is always difficult and tricky. And it's not that it's impossible, it's just that one of the things that we have is at the problem of relatively small numbers and rare effects, because even the whole population of New Zealand isn't big enough to detect effects if they are very small because there's like five million of us. So something that occurs one in a million may be very, very difficult to detect. So I'm not in any way wanting to say anything other than that we acknowledge that there are multiple types of disadvantage that populations can experience. But I think the answer to that is much broader than the health services and is actually a collective um, effort from all engaged um, to try to improve the social and environmental conditions in which our populations live. Um, as my colleague said earlier today, that's one of the reasons we're in public health, is that we recognise that there are limitations on what health services can do, and that many of the more important determinants of health exist at a population, or whether it's a local, a regional, or a national level, and that's that's where we we tend to address our practice. So sorry, just have have we talked to like the university or the Otago Medical School about? doing some sort of outreach program looking at the, the, the impacts at a population level? Like, is there anything, like recognising the concerns that you've raised around the health register, Yeah. what I'm trying to understand is, is there any other thing that we can facilitate, that we can support, that we can fund? I mean, we have university students that go out and count fish in the estuary, right? Which is great. I mean, it's excellent. We've got people that are really stressed out, as you've acknowledged, with a whole bunch of symptoms that are 
relevant to what's going on. Is there anything that we can do? I mean, what would be if we if if you don't support a health register, is there anything that you would support that we can do to get an understanding around what's impacting on local people, short of going on Facebook, looking at social media, looking at all the self-reporting that people are doing, which you know has produced some quite um, interesting and obviously quite concerning. It has indeed, results. and I guess the the. I would come back to what would be the purpose of the collection of that information. Would it tell us anything that we don't already know, which is that people are suffering and that they're suffering from a number of things which they have in common and that it seems very likely that that's related to the odour. In terms of the um, work that we did looking at registers, population-wide surveys are an option here, but the question then becomes what do you do with that information? How does that inform your response right. in a way that's actually helpful? as opposed to simply measuring the impact, which isn't quite the same thing. So, so that's possible. I, I guess I probably also ought to declare that I could consult myself because I work for the University of Otago as well mm -hmm. uh, from in there as a senior lecturer in public health. But that is certainly that, that is an option, but I think the issue that you would be considered there is logistical as well as who would you survey? The entire population of Christchurch? Because in the terms of the smelt, it, people are experiencing, or well, at least reporting, experiencing both the odours and health effects for elsewhere. So I think that it's, it, sounds, it sounds very simple to do, but actually it's much more complicated because you really want to survey the exposed population. And we don't know for certain who they are. So it comes back to that same question as for the registers. So that's really, that is one of the things that could be considered uh, to be done, um, but... I think also that in terms of by the time that you would set up to do it, it might well be that a number of the problems are actually already resolved. So I guess the concern that people have is that while they understand in the short term that there will be improvements made and, mm. you know, we're all optimistic that September will, will help, they're worried that the exposure now is going to lead to long-term health impacts that we don't know. Right. And they want a, a reassurance that if there are permanent and long-term health impacts on their well-being, that that has been recorded somewhere so that there, there's a follow-up rather than just, you know, all individually having to rely on going to a GP, which, um, you know, maybe many people can't afford or, you know, there's a cost barrier. So I think that was my understanding of the request around a health register. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like, we require workplaces to do it for staff that have potential exposure, as I understand it. So I guess people see that, you know, this should be treated in a similar manner. But I, I was just, in the other two questions I had, one was reducing barriers to mental health support and GPs visits. Um, what can we do to provide either free assessments or reduce the cost of GP assessments and mental health services? What's the best way that this council can support the health response to doing m more in our local community, whether it's specific clinics and areas or making access um, more widely available? Well, just to answer the first part of that, um, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, we have passed the request on to the Planning and Funding Division of the DHB, who I understand are directly in contact now with council staff to talk about the question of funding of free GP visits. I, I'll just pass over to Lucy just to talk a bit more about what's happening at the community level around, particularly around mental health support. So I agree with you, Yanni, that actually reducing the barriers for people to be able to access individual care, which will be fed into the big system, which will have the impact of, 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 of um, measuring, if possible, what the collective impact has been. That is the work that's underway. So um, as Cheryl says, we're part of the public health unit. Um, and so, and so Council does need to keep talking to planning and funding as the commissioning unit. And, uh, and Council is already engaged with uh, Pegasus Health, who will provide the bulk of the um, primary care services locally. They have a whole range of, um, of initiatives to try and increase access. And they are focused on the east side, the final order and navigators, the uh, prim I always get it wrong, the prim PCWs, primary yeah. care uh, workers. Um, and so that, that is actively being explored and some of it is already underway. And our, and our job is to make sure that people know that that's available, know that it will have some effect um, and know that 
it will help them to understand that we do believe them. It is a horrendous situation, um, and and anything we can do to support um, is 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 crucial. Um, so 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 I agree with you. We need to make these these uh, services as accessible as possible. So sorry, sorry if, it, if it requires funding, like can can we? as a council, contribute some funding towards that? I think like, that's the conversation that's underway. Right. So when could we quantify what the cost would be I and how can how soon can we make a decision? I, I think that's the conversation that really is underway and um, I, 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 okay. I agree with you. It's really important and I think it, you know, so we we need to see whether so we can just, make it Just happen. a final question from me is, um, so one, one of the concerns in the community, and I, I don't, I, I think... I've heard you say that you're involved in looking at the test results. If you go to the commentary around the test results, and the, the latest one I can find is from like 8, 8th of June, and it just says some H2S concentrations have been measured in the ambient air downwind of CWTP exceed the OEHHA air quality criteria for potentially causing headache, nausea, and psychological responses to odour. Um, and then it goes on. However, the measured concentrations are much lower than the OE. HHA acute exposure guidelines notable uh, for notable irritation and discomfort or for more serious health effects above 41 ppm. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's virtually impossible for the community to see what the results of the air quality monitoring are and where they're exceeding or below the acceptable limits for um, whether it's the, you know, um, acute exposure or the or, or the other, um, you know, the, the, I guess the, you know, the, the lesser scale. But people, like, if you look at the testing results and the way in which they're being conveyed to the community about what's, what's an, um, you know, what levels they should be concerned about, you, you can't really see, like, if you go to the charts that are presented, you just see a bunch of numbers and lines. It's not clear which sites are are in breach or are um, above or below what levels. And it's not clear to the community when things would be at a dangerous level, which they might need to change. You want to get to the question. Or alter yeah. their behaviour. So, you know, I guess I um, was really understanding if there's any work that you're doing around the air quality testing results around health impacts that would explain to people in very simple terms what, what the levels of concern are and where. Um, and just related to that, one of the things that came out from the community meeting um, was around the education and what outreach is health providing to the schools around the impact on children's health. So I don't know if there's anything that you could... Well, perhaps to take the first point first around the monitoring, I think that um, one of the things that I am aware of, but um, Nigel and Helen can speak more directly to, is that there is an intention to provide more useful narrative reporting around those results, which is a bit more accessible, but it is kind of early days, as Nigel has explained, for the hydrogen sulphide monitoring, and we're talking about just a few sites. So that is certainly something that I would support because I quite agree that it's really difficult for people to understand that data. I think the council has been very transparent in putting that data there because there are people who do understand it and interpret it, but you're correct that for most people that's kind of... It's not terribly helpful. So that narrative reporting, there is already some of that on Council's website, but that's something that could definitely be improved. In terms of the education and what is happening there, I'll perhaps turn to Lucy to speak to so that. So Ministry of Education are a part of the, uh, the social response group that uh, council convenes. Um, uh, there are some interesting initiatives. Um, well, Gary's spoken to the funding that's been made available and, and taken up. Um, uh, there are some interesting science projects that are going to come out of this, which is really important because science communication, particularly to young people, is one way of, of, of increasing reassurance and, and helping understanding. Um, in terms of uh, the health of children, again, uh, the best way to care for your children's health is to engage with primary care um, because at that individual level, Parents or, or caregivers need to be able to to look after their kids and get them the best health care possible. We haven't heard from education. We work very closely with education, mm -hmm. and we haven't heard from them that there is um, 
that there is profound need related to this. We know that there are a lot of kids and teachers off sick because of the perfect storm that Cheryl oh. described earlier. And, and as a parent, the concern is, uh, is how can I help my sick child, not, not in the first instance, what is causing the sickness? Mm -hmm. I think Cheryl talked earlier as well about the concentrations ha uh, being, uh, I'm, I'm on dodgy ground here, but, but actually people do need to respond to their own set of symptoms um, because we will all experience these levels differently. I think that was in one of Nigel's slides. Mm -hmm. And so for the people who have acutely sensitive uh, uh, sense of smell, this is hell. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we acknowledge that. All right. Thank you very much. Anne, you've got a question. Um, I think some of us may have been concerned when we heard a reference to asbestos in terms of long-term <laughs> Uh, you know, effects. So, could you? Uh, what I what what we've heard from you, Cheryl, is that you ex you would expect that the effects of this will diminish as the smell is dealt with. Can you just clarify again what what your thoughts are on that? Yes, I think um, perhaps the mention of asbestos is is always concerning. But one of the things that we do actually have a very good understanding of the long term health effects of asbestos exposure, which the reason for the decades is that that may present as early, as early as 20 years after exposure, but anything to 30 to 40 years afterwards. In this situation, as I've already said, this is an extraordinarily unlikely with hydrogen sulfide because, I say, it is a gas, it's breathed in and breathed out and undoubtedly causes health effects. But unless you are, um, exper unless you are exposed to very high doses, suffer the toxic effects and survives, it's extremely unlikely that there will be any long-term damage However, as I say, I qualified that by my reference to sensitisation, is that some, some people may still experience some of these effects at much lower concentrations because of that pre-sensitivity. That's not, doesn't reflect kind of damage in the sense of damage to the organ. It's effect any organs of the body. It's simply a kind of retuning of the physiological responses that we all have to odour. Thank you. Celeste. Um, thank you. Um, so, I, as I understand, I mean, has, has this been treated as an emergency situation? And have we been kind of looking at it as a sort of a disaster response that requires looking at what the immediate needs of communities are, <coughs> as well as the mid and long term needs? So, um, my question is, and referring to sort of things, if we look at it on a national level, one of the key learnings is about making sure that people know on a regular basis, you know, they're given as much information as possible. And even if it's not the complete picture, it's saying we know that we've got a health crisis, this is what we're doing. And, and then that's the immediate response. And then you've got the midterm and the long term plan. So my question is um, in terms of immediately after the event, what was the risk health response? Was there good information provided to communities about minimising the sort of any environmental hazards, um, making sure that they've got information about keeping themselves physically and mentally healthy. And then if we look at sort of mid and long term, is there enough information in your view to um, make sure that people understand that this response is coordinated at the right level, including the Ministry for Health, and looking at that psychosocial kind of response in the long term? Sort of, so I'm sort of asking, I guess, immediate, midterm, long term. We've kind of gone past the short term stuff, but we still need to. <laughs> well, I guess in the immediate term, uh, in terms of our public health unit's specific response to the fire itself, um, we put out advice to the public, which is the same as we would do for any fire or any large fire that's generating a lot of smoke. And that um, was put through our usual communications channels and shared through council's communications channels. Primarily, that advice is as it always is, which is to shelter in, shelter in place unless ordered to evacuate, close doors and windows, a whole lot of the standard kind of advice around fires. And that advice was um, shared and updated. Um, then there is the kind of the period of time where I think the response that you're seeking is probably not so much from us, but from the wider council is what happened in the intermediate period. Because at that stage, the question of odour was not the primary concern. 
The primary concern for us from a public health functioning point of view is can you have a functioning sewage treatment plant given the damage? Because sewage treatment plants are actually one of the things that um, we do as a society to protect people from the hazards of our own waste and to treat those effectively. And there would have been a much bigger public health emergency and problem had the sewage treatment plant not been able to operate. In terms of recovery, or at least you know, planning in the long term, I think probably that from the point of view of the health sector, the immediate concerns had passed with that future thing. And until we were engaged by council to request further advice and support, no, I can say that there were no specific plans from the health perspective until we were engaged by council from on, on that. Um, but in terms of the other questions you've asked around kind of a coordinated approach and recovery, I think probably the social response group and Gary and the team are probably best placed to talk to you about that and the council's recovery plan. Here, we are very happy to be a support agency and very, very happy to um, provide advice and support to what council is doing. So you mentioned um, psychosocial. My working definition of that horrible word is it's supporting communities to um, respond uh, as well as possible in adverse circumstances. And these are clearly adverse circumstances. And it's been acknowledged that the most affected people have already lived through many, many sets of adverse circumstances. So there are many layers there. Um, we know that the, 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 the important things to support are people's sense of safety, calm, connectedness, hope, and ability to react positively, you know, have some agency. Agency is very, uh, is, is very compromised in this situation because we're all waiting for the plant to be, to be mended. Um, but there are things that can be done through, the, through brokering the sense of connection um, and, uh, and, and reassuring people that whilst it's really unpleasant, we are, we are monitoring to make sure that it is safe and we need to communicate that well. So I appreciate that this is a really messy space um, and there is no uh, silver bullet to, to, to make sure that everyone feels great in this, in this situation, but to support people to feel as good as they can and function as well as they can, that is an interagency uh, piece of work that's currently underway. Sorry, and can I just check when? So when was that work started in terms of the interagency coordination? Because if if we treat this as a disaster, which it is, I would assume that in addition to the technical work to remove the trickling filter materials, which we I think we've done, you know, we've been com sort of communicating very transparently around that. I'm not hearing much information around the coordination around the health response, which is the bit that I think people want to also know about. Well, I mean, the health response has has al always been there. Uh, you know, there has always been primary care available. There has, um, it, it, this isn't a declared emergency, so there hasn't been the whole set of functions that that um, that would have been able to provide you minutes of those things. It, uh, and so, in terms of the social response group, as far as I'm aware, it was convened in. June, May, um, uh, but 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 there has been work underway as part of people's business as usual, and their business is to respond to community needs. So there will have been that that work underway from health providers in the region, in the affected area. All right, thank you very much. Now I'm not seeing anybody else indicating questions for the medical team. And one last question, and then we need to move on. Just um, you've you know you've rightly um, emphasised how distressing this is for many people, and they are in distress. But you've also talked about, um, Lucy, that, that agency, and that's about perhaps bringing some hope into a situation. Apart from that connection that you talked about, getting people together and, and talking and clear communication, what else can the community, what else can we do to build and engender that sense of hopefulness? Well, I'm, I think we're all hoping that that we maintain the deadline for the repairs and um, and and uh, or, or even um, beat that one. Um, the communications are really important, and the uh, the trustworthiness of the shared communication is really important. And we're completely committed to that, um, to playing our part in that. Um, 
and the communication of complex scientific facts. I agree with Yanni, those, those slides are quite intimidating. Um, but in terms of uh, brokering trust for people who have really suffered, that's not an easy fix. We just have to keep on being authentic and honest and hope that that, that is, uh, is going to grow some trust because it's, it's genuine from our part, side of the partnership. Can I just add to that, just as a sort of, I guess, a final comment? Um, so we've heard a lot of information today that we haven't heard before. Um, we will now um, really ramp up in terms of our communications on behalf of all the parties, um, um, in, including um, from Cheryl, you know, what Cheryl and, and Lucy will be um, working with us on. We will ramp up our communications around some of the health impacts um, of the odour. And as we get more data, and we can r interpret it better, um, and we are doing that more work on those different thresholds or standards, we will be um, including that in our communications. All right, thank you very much. I, we do need to move on. Cheryl, um, thanks to you and your team for the work that you're doing and for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks very much indeed. Um, now we'll move to any questions of our own staff. Um, so we've got the report, which will take us red. Um, we've had the presentation. Are there any questions arising from that from our own staff? I do want to close this part of the meeting off at 11 o'clock at the very latest. Um, we've got a big agenda ahead of us. Phil. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Just, just real quickly, all of the cost of these lovely people that were here, the, the extra spares, the staff time, the video, the posters, flies, all of that is all going is all being paid by insurance it's all in a big ball of wax is it um some of the work that we're doing is actually just our business as usual so we are just absorbing that as part of our business as usual um where we can we will be putting the cost to our insurance thank you thank you aaron another really quick one um and this is when we inform ecan about the um test results off the offshore do we also inform Form um, Naitahu or local iwi as well, just as part of our partnership. Uh, we're keeping in touch with Jay Hippy internally, and he's talking with uh, the local representatives, who particularly those who are interested in the estuary and that coastal area. So we do do that. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. One microphone Turn on 28 of July but I just want to know based on following the series the questions whether a moment even this draft not yet present to council but whether those close agency already you know each one fully understand based on the terms reference uh, time frame the, the, the cost uh, or uh, etc already have this conversation am I right Yes, 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 we've had that conversation. And the draft, I'm, I'm expecting to have the draft completed, hopefully, yes. by the end of this week, yes. to be able to present it to the partners and to the um, community panel early next week. Um, and then once that's done, I'll be back. Um, hopefully the next briefing of the week after, I'll be here with it for you. So just to be clear, the 28th is the next formal meeting of the council, council. and that's what we will formally bring you the, um, the plan. But we will brief councillors and let councillors um, sort of you know, work with the plan, draft plan before then. Thank you. Great, thank you. Celeste. So can I just clarify, is it the, on the 28th, is that when you come in to report back about that out of zone review? Yes, yep. So that's approximately a month from now? Yes, that's right. So, because we're aware that the majority of the smells coming from lots of ash and ponds, and that's actually changed the, I guess, the range of areas that are impacted by the source of the odour. Are there things that we're going to be putting in place to address immediate need? It's sort of a question that's been asked, but in terms of that out of zone support. So we know that the source of the odour has shifted. Say the wind direction also changes over different periods of time. So we know that pe perhaps some of the other areas adjacent to the ponds are suffering impacts now, but we're waiting a month to report back on reviewing the out of zone support. Yeah, so the but out of zone package that I have, yeah. um, remembering that the large amount of that is for the, um, the immediately affected within the zone. So while I'm running at 69% of acceptance there, um, we do have to monitor the, the out of zone. 
I get, I do understand what you're asking though, because of the weather changing and everything. Would we look at now looking at those people differently? Yes, we would. Okay. Uh, and sorry, I'll just quickly have a couple more. Um, so we know the property report's coming back in about two weeks. Is that right? Roughly speaking? And we'll go back to residents who have got questions about that. Yes, yes. Yep. Um, and then uh, just quickly, you might have explained this already, but in terms of the, a noticeable reduction in the smell from the oxidation ponds, which is, is that September? The, we should see a, a reduction in the smell from the oxidation ponds earlier than September. Uh, and so that relies on, first of all, establishing that biological treatment and then flushing the water through the oxidation ponds. However, we, we need to keep in mind that the, um, the areas infected, affected by the odours and the degree of that is very much dependent on the weather conditions. So at the moment, we've got that, this cold, very still weather, um, and so the odour isn't being swept away as it was earlier in the year when it was windy. So that's part of the reason why it's pretty difficult at the moment. So yes, the ponds are in poor condition and the weather conditions are working against us with those still conditions. So as we move through the next um, few weeks, we will see an improvement. However, it'll be up and down for different parts of the neighbourhood depending on those, um, on those winds as well as the, the improvements in the ponds. And I think the other thing that we need to keep in mind is as Cheryl Brunton was talking about, and as we showed on that slide about um, odour thresholds and people being upset, some people are very sensitive to these odours. Um, and so even as the ponds start to improve, they will not notice that improvement. Um, other people who are less sensitive probably will. So, you know, if you take, if you take five people, say I take Sam down to, um, to Councillor Chen, um, at that odour threshold of the 30 parts per billion or 0.03 parts per million, we're saying that 83% of people or the Californian Office of um, Environmental Health are saying that 83% of people will smell it. So, um, you know, Councillor MacDonald down to Councillor Johansson will smell it and um, Councillor Chen won't. He won't notice it at all. Um, and then there's the 40% who are very badly affected at that level. So they don't just notice it, they get symptoms. Um, so Councillor MacDonald and Councillor Chu are saying, this is disgusting, I've got headaches, nausea, and these other three are saying, I can smell it, but it's okay. So you've got that, you've got that big range of response in the community, and the people on the sensitive end, such as Councillor MacDonald, are still going to be complaining. Yeah. <laughs> just to be clear. Just about the smell. So we've got, yeah. we're, we're dealing with, um, not only are we dealing with biological processes and slow changes that are affected by the weather, we're dealing with a diverse community and some very sensitive um, receivers, if you like. So some people are affected a lot more than others. Yes. And it would it be correct to say that some people are more affected because they've been had repeated exposure? So I might have a different sensitivity to say to Sarah. That, no, that I'm also more sensitive because I... According to the Ministry for the Environment, they say that repeat exposure to low levels of odour can create a heightened sensitivity. That's on top. That's on top. So that's, so that's just thing. for a general population, that, that, um, that work that's done on sensitivity. And that's just about how acute your own sense of smell is for that particular range of compounds. Um, Thank you. So Thank you. Um, now, Yanni, I'll come to you for one, for one quick question, because we are just about out of time. Yeah, OK. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of questions, so I'll just try and find one. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, this is such a significant issue in our community. Um, I, I think maybe we can get a briefing maybe next week and look at, I mean, because obviously you don't, you don't want to spend the time. Well, we, we don't have the time. We've, we've right. spent almost an hour and a half on this this morning already. Um, okay. I would love to have the luxury of time, but we've got a full agenda ahead of us. So if we can just take one question and then let's take offline how we deal with any other outstanding matters that you've got. Right. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, OK. Um, so, I, I mean, I think what's apparent is that people want to see us do more. So we've heard um, the, the painting analysis. Um, we've heard... You know, people should go see a GP if they're concerned. I, I, I just kind of wanted to understand, like, rather than wait to the end of the month, are there practical things that we could do now, like helping people clean up the, the black stuff? 
um, or um, helping people do assessments of what the best thing is, you know, air purifiers, um, et cetera, for their own individual circumstances or provide um, the access to the GPs and the mental health. And I appreciate we've heard today that um, there's going to be a funding discussion, but, you know, could we look at something in the short term, like Celeste has raised, um, like could we fund a clinic at the Bromley Community Centre for, you know, two hours or three hours a week um, to just get some immediate support while those longer term things are done? That, I mean, it's really just a question of what's the immediate practical help and support that we could give people, given that we've previously heard that money isn't an object to stopping us doing anything that we need to do in terms of the response. Yeah. So if we can get a quick answer to that question, and then let's refer the other matters, Yanni, that you've clearly got to a workshop or a briefing that we can we can hold once we've looked at what the subjects of that briefing or workshop need to be, which may well be based around some of these issues that you've got. But if we can just get a quick answer to that question, and then we need to close off this yeah. part of the meeting. So if there's anything that we can do or our partners can do, um, and, it's, and we've agreed that it's actually going to add value, then we will be doing it. Um, if there is a financial um, implication for what we might want to do, um, we may have to come back and get a formal decision of this council. So um, we will be looking at all our options. Um, we are working effectively with our partners. It won't be us delivering everything, um, and that's why we've got our partners on board with us. Um, we will be definitely looking to progress anything that we can that's going to improve the, um, the well-being of that community that's most affected. Um, and if there is a financial issue, we will think about how we might manage that. And if there's something really urgent, then we, we will look at potentially bringing it back to uh, a um, unprogrammed committee council meeting. But we know that there's a meeting on the 28th, and that's the date that we are sort of looking at in terms of getting uh, any big decisions made around financial decisions that staff don't have delegation for. Well, I will speak to health after this around that exact idea, Councillor Johansson, and if we can do it, we'll do it. All right, so let's consider, outside of what we're doing today, a briefing or a workshop where we can consider any outstanding matters or relevant matters. Um, let's take that conversation outside of this meeting, but actively um, consider how we might best use some, some additional time. All right, that's great. So thanks very much indeed to staff and to the medical team for the report and for the presentation and answers to questions this morning. Um, that brings us to um, three minutes past 11. What I'm going to do now is to adjourn for morning tea, but just until 11.15 um, when we've got venues Otatahi joining us. So it's going to be a shortened morning tea break this morning again in the interest of time. Back here at 11.15 with venues Otatahi. Thank you.